What a week. Sydney Sutherland's killer just pled guilty to capital murder and rape. So what's next? And then let's talk about Gabby Petito and that Moab video that was released. And then Charles Vallow's autopsy report and another twist in the Chad Daybell case. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Profiling Evil and this review of this week's crime cases of interest. I hope you'll take a moment, hit that like and the subscribe button, ring the bell so that you get the latest notifications and updates. And if you're part of the Profiling Evil family and you live in Latvia or the Baltic state or even Eastern Europe, let me know. Send us an email and we'll catch up next week while I'm over there. I got some business meetings with law enforcement leaders from across the region. It would be fun to meet with you if everything comes together. But let's start with Chad Daybell and Charles Vallow. As prosecutors and defense in the Chad Daybell case were preparing for this change of venue hearing, the prosecutor surprised the defense with a motion to sequester the jury. <laughs> That's right. Madison County Prosecutor Wa Rob Wood reportedly stated that he wants to have jurors from another county serve in this trial. Wood and Fremont's County uh, Prosecutor Lindsey Blake said that they won't object to a change of venue, hoping that it will happen in Blake's County. The, the reason? They want a fair trial. Judge Stephen Boyce will consider the new motion next week, but he ordered the prosecution to bring some information about the cost that this is going to be on the court. You know, when they do something like this, it really is quite costly. And you're probably wondering, what's sequestering? It's where the members of the jury are not allowed to go home during the trial. They, they keep them in a hotel room, they feed them day and night, and they uh, limit the access that they have to media accounts so that they're not somehow influenced by what's being reported. Well, true to form, Daybell's attorney, John Pryor, complained that this 11th hour request didn't give him enough time to prepare for an argument against it. He called the prosecutors grandstanders and said that they were playing games. Well, Judge Boyce kind of counseled Pryor and said, you're making too big of a deal out of this. You know, it seems like what the prosecution is doing is exactly what we predicted. They're trying to minimize the number of things that the defense can complain about or ultimately appeal if Daybell gets convicted. Now, this is going to be worth waiting for as this case unfolds, so keep watching it. And, and while Chad Daybell escaped prosecution in the death of Charles Vallow, the autopsy on his death was released just yesterday, showing some really interesting evidence. Most importantly, the autopsy of Charles Vallow shows that he died as a result of two gunshot wounds to the chest and the abdomen. Now, the first round entered into his chest about 18 inches below the top of his head. So about 18 inches down and went right through the sternum. Now, take a moment. Think back to all the times you saw video of Alex Cox at the gun range showing off his big weapons and everything else. The shot that killed Vallow was in the X-ring or the center mass in police firearm terminology, the place that you practice for when you're at the gun range. That first bullet traveled slightly downhill, so it came down and then exited his back. And, and I think this is really important information when you consider where Charles was lying on the floor face up. And we're kind of looking at some of that video. Remember that Alex said he raced to his bedroom to retrieve his gun to stop Charles' attack. Well, Charles was near the front door. Cox said, fearing for his life, as Charles was approaching him rapidly, he fired to protect himself. Remember, he had the little wound on his head as evidence. Well, the autopsy evidence suggests to me two really important things. First, that Alex was either in the kitchen area or he stepped out of the hallway, ambushing Vallow as both men were standing erect. Now think about this. Alex Cox is about two inches taller than Vallow. And that explains why that first round, because you'd hold that weapon out straight when you fire, when you're practicing at the range 
or when you're shooting. It's just a natural response. Now, what's more important here is that he's two inches taller. So that round went in and kind of went downhill, explaining why it exited just a few inches below where it entered in the back. Entered from the front in the sternum, exited in the back. Now, what's more important is that there's no stippling, no gunshot stippling on Vallow, according to the medical examiner. This is huge. It's really important because forensically we can prove now that Vallow had to still be at least two feet, probably three feet or further away from Cox when he was shot. There was no stippling on uh, the arms of, uh, of Vallow. And stippling is burns from the gunpowder and residue and marks, little red marks appear from the gunpowder burning them. Now, if someone were shooting at Charles and he had enough time to respond, he could have put his arms up, reached out for the gun. That would have even extended that area another two to three feet. So it's potential that Cox was six or more feet away when he shot Charles Vallow. Really important. Cox wasn't defending himself. He was executing Charles Vallow. Now, another thing that I found interesting is that the second bullet entered Charles' body was fired into the abdomen, 27 inches below the top of the head. So uh, Charles' body was actually starting to fall backwards from that first round that hit him in center mass. Now, the body or the bullet went in 27 inches below the top of his head. And it exited 14 inches below the top of his head. So the bullet was actually traveling upwards as it went into uh, Vallow's body. This means he was either falling backwards or he was already on the ground with Cox standing at his feet, shooting that second round into his body. Again, an execution suggests his motivation was to execute Charles, not to defend himself. Now, the picture it paints for me is that Charles entered the house in a non-threatening manner, probably thinking he was going to pick up his son, Joshua, take him to school like it, like it was planned. Once inside the house, he was ambushed and murdered. Within hours, isn't it strange that Lori Vallow and Alex Cox were spending the evening at a pool party with their new friends and neighbors? How on earth did they ever think that it would appear anything but odd to every other person in the, in the world? Yet, these two got away with it for a short time. Well, make sure you read that entire autopsy report for details on this case. And then, we'll all just wait for Lori Vallow Daybell to become competent to stand trial for the deaths of her children, Joshua J.J. Vallow, and Tylee Ryan. And let's not forget the death of Tammy Daybell. Once those cases are adjudicated, she's going to face Arizona charges, the murder charges in the death of Charles Vallow. Well, now let's jump over to the case that we've been following since it happened with the murder of Sydney Sutherland a year ago. This 25-year-old woman from Arkansas who was struck by a pickup truck while she was jogging along a road. The truck was driven by 25-year-old Quake Llewellyn, an acquaintance, who then abducted the woman, raped her, and then murdered her. He was arrested within a few days and has been awaiting trial in a capital murder case, meaning that the state of Arkansas was seeking the death penalty. Now, if you don't know about this case, please go back to our story map on Sydney's murder. You can get it at profilingevil.com and click on story maps. Just scroll through the list to Sydney uh, Sutherland. Uh, also, you can catch our interviews with reporter Mitch McCoy, who has followed this case from day one. You can learn a lot more by going to our videos on the Profiling Evil playlist. Well, here we are. Llewellyn's attorneys unsuccessfully argued against the death penalty efforts of the prosecution. They also failed at their attempts at getting Llewellyn's confession thrown out. So a hearing was set for today with a jury trial. 
But right now, Mitch McCoy is uh, reporting a, a plea deal is in the works. I thought it might be interesting to listen to this as Mitch shares the news. You might remember Mitch again appearing here on Profiling Evil to discuss the case. Let's listen in. We begin this evening with breaking news. Sources telling Fox 16 a plea deal has been negotiated with Quake Llewellyn. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Fox 16 News. I'm Kevin Kelly. Llewellyn is charged in the kidnapping, rape, and murder of Sidney Sutherland last summer. Our Mitch McCoy following this story closely. He joins us live in studio with the latest information. Mitch, what have you been able to find out? Well, Kevin, hello. It's the case that, that gripped the nation and in much of Arkansas. Sources close to the case tell me tonight that a deal between prosecutors and the defense was reached earlier today. I'm told Quake Llewellyn will be in court tomorrow. What that deal includes has not been publicly released. Those sources tell me while it's been negotiated, nothing is really finalized until Llewellyn faces is the judge again that's tomorrow it was nearly 14 months ago Sutherland was running on Jackson County Road 41 when troopers say Llewellyn hit her with his truck then raped her crew spent days searching for the 25 year old the case garnered worldwide attention court documents show state police found a GPS tracking app on Llewellyn's phone which if you remember eventually led troopers to Sutherland's body earlier this year in an exclusive interview with the Sutherlands they told me they wanted the death penalty while we don't know the exact plea deal, uh, we can look at history here in Arkansas and other capital murder cases. The death penalty is usually taken off as an option. Usually that means life without parole. But again, we just don't know yet. We should learn more in the coming hours, maybe even tomorrow, Kevin. And, and we just got to wait for those court documents to officially be filed. Well, Lou Ellen's attorney cited three U.S. Supreme Court decisions to back up their argument, but the prosecution countered that they would amend the charging information and they'd include aggravating circumstances that called for the death penalty, demanded it almost, saying, quote, notably that the capital murder was committed in an especially depraved manner, indicating that the defendant relished the murder evidencing debasement and perversion and showing an indifference to the suffering of the victim and evidencing a sense of pleasure in committing the murder, close quote. Well, knowing that their client could possibly get the death penalty, it undoubtedly caused Llewellyn and his defense team to rethink their strategy and to try to negotiate this case to avoid his execution. My guess was last night that he, the deal would be struck to spare his life. Let's just take a couple of minutes, though. I want to go back to a report by Mitch McCoy from 2021, March, where he spoke with Sydney's family. These eerie interactions that Quake Llewellyn had with them during the search was incredible. On one occasion, Llewellyn said he called Sydney's brother and said that he saw Sydney running over a bridge while she was jogging, but he didn't see her again. This guy showed up for the search and participated. And during the search, Llewellyn approached Sydney's mom. He spoke to her about the missing woman. And after he spoke to her, he apparently hugged Cindy's mother, and it made her feel incredibly uncomfortable, creepy. Let's listen into this video. Bob and Laura, hello. Our conversation went on for more than an hour at the family's home just outside Newport. Tonight, Sydney Sutherland, the young nurse from Jackson County, Arkansas, and the family who was forced into the national spotlight for all of the wrong reasons. County Road 41, where asphalt and gravel meet, and a pink cross marks the spot where one story ends and another begins. Sydney Sutherland is my baby girl, my best friend. Maggie Sutherland, Sydney's mom, says the mother daughter duo were always side by side. We go to ball games and still sit with friends, she would sit with me. Sydney, just 25, a little sister. She was always the baby. Sam, one of her big brothers. Family events, I mean, she'd let you know what you needed to bring and, and how it was going to go. From either side of our family, she was the only girl. We had all boys. Days before their nightmare would begin, the family was on a vacation in Florida, a regular getaway trip. Sam's then five-month-old daughter with Sydney, better known as Aunt Sassy. She loved being an aunt. 
she was going toward the wind. That's who she was. The Sutherlands got back to Jackson County late that Tuesday night, August 18th, 2020. We got home, we just went straight to bed. Yes. And next morning, was back to work. And yes. And Sydney, after a workout with the trainer captured on this surveillance photo the next morning, unloading from the family's vacation, the last photo they have of her. She said, then I'm going to go run it. And I was like, Sydney, don't run today. You know, we've been gone. Rest, get you some you sleep. You just left the trainer? Yes, you left the trainer. You did an hour hard workout. Why would she goes, it just releases me. The 25 year old went for her run on Jackson County Road 41. The phone rang a few hours later. It was Sydney's boyfriend. He called me right after five and he says, have you seen Sydney? And I said, no. Calls to Sydney went to voicemail. My heart just dropped. Texts unanswered. Something just was not right. Snapchats unread. My fear was um, being kidnapped on that rope. In all hands on search started for Sydney. We were just trying to find any kind of clue that we could. Hundreds of volunteers descended on County Road 41. Detectives searched for anyone who may have seen something. Sam says he got a phone call. One of the first tips from someone he knew in town. Called me and said that Quake seen her headed south over the overpass, headed back home. And that's all, that was basically all that was said. So we knew the last sighting of her was at the interstate headed home. By Quake. By Quake. Quake Llewellyn, 28, a familiar face to the family, graduated high school just a few years before Sydney joined the search. He just walked up and just stood by a tree. Maggie says Quake appeared to be lurking, maybe trying to listen in near the command post. Walked over to him and I said, Quake, can you tell me anything? What did, what's Sydney doing? You know, did you see anything unusual? Did you meet anybody unusual? He goes, no, she was just running. I said, you don't have anything you can tell me. No, she was just running. And he just kind of gave me a little hug. He gave you a hug? Gave me a hug. What did that feel like in that moment? It was, a, it, I, something felt odd. I walked back over to the group and I was like, something's wrong. And odd it was. That very next morning, Quake and his dad went to Arkansas State Police for an interview. After all, Sam says Quake's dad is the one who called in one of those first few tips. State troopers say the two allowed investigators to search their truck. That's when detectives say they found blood inside the cracks of the tailgate. Back on 41, a glimmer of hope. Well, we were down on our hands and knees, crawling on the ground, and I was like, I found a bead. Sydney's been here. But as that hope started setting in, Sam's phone rang. Sheriff David Lucas needed him to gather the family. That was the hardest trip I've ever had to take is from, uh, from the overpass to the house. They told me there's a body discovered and, and, uh, and that's basically all they told me. But I knew, but then I knew we was gonna have to go up there and break it to her too. So, so I mean, it was, uh, it was just not, that, that part was the worst part, by far. Detectives found Sydney. He just broke it to me. It was um, devastating. Even harder to grasp why Llewellyn allegedly picked her daughter. Sam says the two knew each other, but they weren't close. Troopers say Llewellyn passed Sydney, turned around at the overpass, and then hit her with his truck. I mean, we just don't know where, where or what happened at the time, you know. Llewellyn is accused of kidnapping, raping, and killing Sydney. The charges he's facing, is that for the death penalty? Yes. Do you want him to face the death penalty? As of right now, I'm gonna say yes. Do you think you guys would ever come to a day where you say, I forgive him? Absolutely not. not. Maggie says it's outpouring of support from around the world, helping the family through its darkest moment. Beautiful blonde hair, dark brown eyes, pearl white smile that lights up the night. Family was a world. At Sydney's final resting spot, there's another bright pink cross. I don't want her to be forgotten. A symbol to remember a young woman taken too soon and an everyday reminder for every parent driving or just jogging by. Don't forget when you see your child and tell them you love them. Could be your last words.
The Sutherlands are creating a foundation in Sydney's name. There's a scholarship for future Arkansas State University students pursuing an education in the medical field. As for Quake Llewellyn, he has pled not guilty in the case. He's not scheduled to be back in court for several months. Back to you. Well, today, prosecutors and defense attorneys came together in a hearing that was packed with more than 60 friends of the Sutherland family. Nearly all of them were wearing Sydney's favorite color, pink, like you saw on that cross. Now, Llewellyn was accompanied by a few family members and his defense team, and he, he didn't make eye contact with anyone. Llewellyn pled guilty to capital murder and rape and will be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In a powerful victim impact statement to the court, Maggie Sutherland, Sydney's mom, looked at Llewellyn and asked, did she fight you? Did she cry? Did she ask for her brothers? This mother then said, Satan is real. The hands you hugged me with are the same hands you killed her with, and she was not yours to take. Well, now let's turn our attention to Gabby Petito's homicide investigation. Brian Laundry is still on the run, or as his family might describe it, just camping. Police are continually frustrated by the lack of cooperation they're getting from the family and certainly from Laundry, this person of interest. But it's clear that more evidence has been discovered as investigators return to the Laundry home to collect more samples of Brian's DNA for testing. Now, back here in my home state of Utah, the Moab Police Department released a second officer's body camera video in the case. This individual arrived on the scene after Petito's van had been pulled over near the entrance to Arches National Park after that domestic violence call. Now, I'd encourage you to listen to the entire interview, but I want to just react to a few segments along the way. And first, it's important to note that Gabby has been taken back to another patrol car as this officer approaches Laundry, who's in the driver's seat of Gabby's car. The officer clearly states that, that they had been notified by the reporting person that witnesses saw Laundry grabbing Gabby by the face, in, in their opinion, assaulting her. Now, Laundry's first comments were about Gabby's behavior, not his own. Let's watch this interaction. How's it going? How are you doing? Good. Hey, we got a call about a male hitting a female and the two of them getting in this vehicle and taking off. So I, it was, I, 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 I just, I don't want to try and defend myself by saying anything here, but I pushed her away. She, she gets really worked up, and when she does, she swings and she had her cell phone in her hand, so I was just trying to push her away. But, um, but, yeah, we have more. What's that? Now, in this next segment, I want to say that I think the officers did an excellent job of trying to calm Gabby down and defuse the situation. Here, we hear the officer asking her what happened at the Moonflower. Gabby described how frustrated she was with Laundry's sloppiness and, and her desire to keep everything organized and in its place. She gave us a glimpse into the relationship and probably how Laundry had thrown everything that she complained about back in her face. You, you can see almost this syndrome starting to really manifest itself. She made comments such as, apparently I'm mean, or things like that. She wanted the two to find some water, and she was so frustrated he was controlling her. She, she kept being told to settle down, making it clear that he was in charge. She described how they started arguing and it got physical. Now in this video, the officer identifies that Gabby has injuries on her left jaw and cheek, as well as on her arm. When the officer inquired about the witness testimony that Brian struck Gabby, Gabby responded, I slapped him first. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Uh, my name's Eric. I'm with Moab Police. What's your name? Gabby. Gabby, how old are you? I'm 22. What happened? What's going on? I'm just having a stress, got a very stressed morning. Yeah? Is this your husband or boyfriend? <laughs> My fiance. Fiance? Is he a pretty good guy? Yeah. What happened over at Moonflower? Yeah. Um, well, I was just really stressed this morning trying to get a lot of work done and 
I was apologizing to him. The, the, I had thrown a bunch of stuff in the back and all our bags are back there. I was just apologizing. I was like, I'm sorry that I get so stressed out because I have OCD and I was just like organizing stuff. And sometimes I just have a mean attitude, but I'm not trying to be mean about straightening things up and stuff. So I was just apologizing, but I guess I said it in like a mean tone and he got really frustrated with me and he walked me out of the car and told me to go take a breather, but I didn't want to take a breather because I wanted to get going. We're out, we're out of water. So it kind of made you more upset. <laughs> yeah, it didn't help calm you. It made you more upset. Yeah. And, so then what happened? And, um, so I, I, our goal was to come here and come refill our water. Are you guys um, living out of the van right now on travels? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, so it was just, it was just really. So what happened after he locked you out? I told you to take a uh, breather. Well, he walked away to go take his own breather, and but I wanted to sit in the car because there was all my stuff was in the car. I had to yeah. run my bag. And I had, so I was working on something at the moment in the car, and he told me to just relax for a second, and I, I didn't want to relax, so I got got really mad. I mean, I don't need to be mad. Yeah, it happens. Then what happened? I think and, then, and then I told him to drive and get water because I'm really thirsty. Yeah? Is there something on your cheek here? Looks like, did, did you get did you get hit in the face? Um, kind of looks like something like hitting you in the face. I don't know. And then over on your arm, um, your shoulder, right here. There's, that's new, huh? Just have a new mark. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Can I see the other side of your face? So, what happened here and here? Um, I, I'm not sure it was a... First thing, Brian. I was just trying to get in the back of the car and his backpack was on the back. Alpha, and uniform, and got me. So, the backpack got gotcha. you? So, there's two people that came to us and told us that they saw him hit you. There's two people saying that they saw him punch you. We're just independent witnesses by Moonflower. Well, to be honest, I definitely hit him first. Where'd you hit him? I stopped him. You, you slapped him first, and then what, just on his face. You get to kind of just shut up. How many times did you slap Bravo, him? Romeo, India, Alpha, just a couple. And then what? And his reaction was to do what? Okay, Maybe I so I slap him. He just grabbed you. Yeah. Did he? Did he hit you though? I mean, I mean, it's okay if you're saying you hit him, and then I, I understand if he hit you, but we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Because well, you know. I guess. Yeah, but I hit him first. Where did he hit you? Don't, don't worry, just well, be he, honest. Like, grabs my face, like, I guess. Uh -huh. um, he didn't, like, hit me in the face. Like, he didn't, like, punch me in the face or anything. Did he slap but, your face or what? Well, like, he, like, grabbed me, like, with his nail. And I guess that's why it looks... I definitely have a cut right here. It's like a peel of yeah. my touch and it burns. But, um... Okay. okay. So, has he been drinking? No, we don't drink. The officer then clarified that Gabby was striking laundry on the arm when she discovered law enforcement was behind them with flashing lights. This can describe some of the marks on laundry's arm, and it might even help with the discussion about Gabby grabbing his arm that it might have caused him to swerve into the curb. But again, we have to rem remember that it might be just a, an artifact of Laundry not paying attention. The officer then spoke with Laundry and identified marks from a fight on the left side of Laundry's neck. This could not have been from the assault while they were driving and, and supports Gabby's confession that she struck him before he grabbed her face at the Moonflower. Now, one officer did indicate that maybe she reached far enough over that when Laundry was turned to look at her, that she scratched, but that's less likely in my opinion. Gentleman here. Yeah. And this gentleman noticed that you had some marks on your on your neck. Yeah. yeah. The officer called the reporting person to confirm that he didn't actually see Brian slap Gabby, but he did confirm that they were fighting over a phone and the caller observed laundry locking Gabby out of a vehicle. Now, it is against the law to disrupt someone from being able to make a phone call during a domestic violence event. And I wonder if law enforcement caught that little piece of the puzzle. But eventually, Gabby jumps into the vehicle over Laundry's lap and into the driving or passenger seat, and they drive away. And it's really important to note that this is the secondary witness that gave this information. So we can't discount the first witness who said he did see Laundry hit Gabby in the face.
when the second witness was asked if he saw Laundry hit Gabby, he responded no. Like they were sort of squabbling over a phone. I want to say that he was trying to grab her phone, and I'm not sure exactly why. And then it seems like uh, he had sort of walked to one side of the van and sort of wasn't letting her in. And, and then the male was stepping into the driver's seat. And she was trying to get into the van, and he said something about why you're being so mean like that and um i i remember he sort of hit him um a few times and it wasn't like slugs in the face but just kind of like like kind of like two kids kind of fighting they, they reminded me of very secure i don't know <laughs> children sort of fighting um but there seemed like something was off and like a weird vibe and um yeah eventually it seemed like you know she crawled into the driver's seat sort of like got into the vehicle over his lap um sort of first her way in, I guess, and, and then they were in the car, and then they just drove away. So, Did yeah. you ever see the male strike the female? I, um, I would say that I think I saw maybe a foot or a dove, but not like a full-on punch in the face or anything. Well, you know, your story is really, really helpful because you're an independent witness, and we've just interviewed both of them. And what you're saying is making everything make a lot of sense. So I really appreciate that I ran into you and that I was able to get your number and talk to you. So thank you very much. Um, I've heard some of you question why this senior officer just didn't take control of the situation. Well, it's, it's a training ground at times. It's not uncommon for a senior officer to give the officer handling the case suggestions, direction. But the case officer in this case was the younger officer. And we can see in the video that the re the responding officers are looking to him for final answers in what's going to happen in the call. It's that officer's responsibility and they might lean on senior officers and supervisors, but they have the call. And that's what happened here. And we can hear the senior officer giving information back to this junior officer who's in charge of the call. He said that he never saw the male strike the female. He saw the male trying to lock her out of the vehicle. She even told us that he was trying to lock her out, told her to go take a walk. So that she was trying to get in. She eventually couldn't get in and actually clawed her way in through the driver's door. He says, I don't understand why she's doing that. Well, I think it's because it was the only door that wasn't locked that she could get through. And I'm sure it was a little of both. I mean, usually the truth is somewhere in between. He's probably trying not to say that he hit her because he probably doesn't want her charged with assault, yeah. domestic assault. He probably would rather say she pulled the wheel than hit, hit him. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Unfortunately for her, she we, we cannot treat, just because he's bigger and stronger, and even if he's not willing to press charges, we can't treat this differently than if it was a male and female violence. Yeah. And we're going to have to charge her, and um, we can do a citation if there's some arrangement that can be made to separate them. And in most states, law enforcement is compelled by state statute to charge those who assault a partner in a domestic violence situation. They, they don't have an, a choice. They don't understand the totality of the relationship. And, and law enforcement's really only there to solve the immediate problem. If there was ever a good argument for mental health professionals responding with police officers on domestic violence, this is a perfect example. Police officers need to have the elements of a crime as evidence so that they can kind of check the boxes and know what to do next. A social worker may have spent much more time understanding the precipitating stressors and all of the things that were going on in this case. Again, I think this is a great example of how the letter of the law can overshadow and confuse the spirit of the law. Now, as you listen to the remainder of the video, you're going to hear Brian decline charging Gabby for the assault, saying he doesn't want to go any further with this. Gabby is saying the same thing. The officers are bound by law to charge Gabby because she, based on Brian and an outside witness and her own testimony, was the first to throw the punch. Law enforcement can't choose one or the other. They can't lean on whether it was a man or a woman, or one seemed more dominant than the other. They have to rely on evidence. And the evidence was that Gabby threw the first punch. 
They're required to separate the two people for 24 hours. And they faced a real interesting dilemma of who they were going to give the vehicle to, which I found confusing because I don't know that there was any question at all. It was Gabby's vehicle. She should have been the one to get it and eventually was. And we see that in this case, law enforcement was able to claim that Brian was a, a victim and they found lodging for him in a shelter that night. Now listen as the officer describes the state law in this case. One of the things that the state legislature doesn't give us discretion on is charges when it comes to a domestic assault. And it sounds like you guys are living together, so you, you meet the statute for domestic partners, and you do have injury, and both an independent witness, probably the next one we're gonna to talk to as well, which we haven't talked to yet, but one, the one we did talk to, and your own companion have made it clear that she was the primary aggressor and that she was striking you and that you received injuries. You haven't admitted to striking her. She has not admitted to you striking her. The witness did not see you strike her. So at this point, you're the victim of a domestic assault. That even, if you, even if you didn't want to pursue this, we don't have a choice. The best thing we could do to not, the losses we have to charge her doesn't say we have to put her in jail. Okay, but it also says we have to separate, do a no contact order, and then we have to put her in jail if we cannot separate. And there's a little problem here is you guys are out of Florida living in the van together. How are we supposed to separate you guys? Now, I don't want to take this small 20, what is she? Yes, a 22 year old. 22 year old female in jail. As the case continues to wind down, the officer confers with the supervising officer, and then they separate the two. Gabby takes the vehicle. Brian goes to a shelter. Brian indicates that he's going to go into the county, a city attorney the next day and drop charges against Gabby and that they would leave together. It, it would be really interesting to see those documents if they ever get released. I'm making this decision. I'm going to cite them. I'm going to go okay. through the first Would you feel more secretary. comfortable handling that guy? Yeah. Go handle that guy. Go handle that guy. I'll handle that guy. Okay. If you're more comfortable. Well, I'm... It's six one way, half dozen the other. It's up to you. I mean, it's a headache whether I go left or it's a headache whether I go Look, right. Look, another option is to not charge them but separate for the night. If they find themselves together again, what is it to you? You separate them. You provided for his safety. If he doesn't have enough sense to stay away and you, you got him separated, it's on him. You can't babysit him all night unless they put her in jail. So it's up to them and not the general. You can separate him and say, don't, don't let this go off till tomorrow. If they don't let it go off and we hear about it, we'll hear about it. They're camping in the park tonight, we'll let you know. And if there's some fighting going on, you already was Mr. Nice Guy. You already gave him a chance. What you can't do, by law, is separate someone and say, if we hear from you again, we're going to arrest one of you. Because then if one of them really needs help, they may not call police and get help. The law says you cannot, literally, you may not say, if we get more problems with you guys tonight, one of you is going to jail. You can't threaten them like that if right. it's true because it will stop someone from wanting to call the police to get help. Does that make sense? All right. So go full or nothing or in between and separate them and kind of give them the nod, the wink, like, hey, you know, just stay separated. It's up to you. I'm going to go handle that. You got very capable help with you here, and I trust you. All right. Call me if you have any problems. Now, I've left out some chilling comments that were made by the responding officer in this case. They seemed almost prophetic. And I left them out in hopes that you'll go back and listen to that entire broadcast that was put out on that second body cam. I'm going to watch for your comments down below on what the officer said and how it impacted you emotionally and, quite frankly, practically. So thanks for supporting Profiling Evil, folks. I hope you enjoyed this quick overview of a number of different cases. And if you did, please let us know as I'm thinking about different ways to provide insight on cases like this. And please, would you hit that like and the subscribe button and ring the bell so that you receive all of our notifications on cases like this? Thanks again. And don't forget, if you're in Latvia or the Baltic states in Europe, Give me a shout. Maybe we can meet up next week. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.